Depression in many ways is a maladapted application of a very good evolutionary response. If we're sick, if we're inflamed, evolutionarily, it might have meant that we just drank the wrong pond water and now we have a bug and we're sick. So retreat from the tribe, don't spread the germs, don't be contagious, don't necessarily engage in social activity or eating or sex. You know, it's a time to go into your cave and rest until you get better. It looks a lot like depression. And that, that system works when the problem was a bug in the pond water. And that system doesn't work when what's inflaming us is our modern world. I'm Lisa Billiou, and I went from housewife to co-founder of the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition, and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize that you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. What's up guys? I hope you enjoy this episode brought to you by our sponsors at Stingray Music. Right now, right this second as you are watching this, over 42 million Americans over the age of 12 have taken an antidepressant this month. And one in six Americans takes some kind of psychiatric drug. Think about that for a second. Think about how many people you know and how many people you may not even realize are suffering from depression, anxiety, bipolar, and other mental disorders. My own husband was suffering from anxiety at one stage and I had no bloody clue. You see, about 15 years ago, we were with my family in London and talking about something funny. And I had this great story to go along with it. So I turned to him and asked him to tell it. Now he's such a funny guy, so I knew it would sound great coming from him. And then something weird happened. He wouldn't tell it. He was being so weird about the whole thing, I just couldn't figure it out. It wasn't until much later did he finally admit to me that he was growing more and more anxious. And in that moment with my family, he felt such crushing anxiety that he couldn't speak. What? I literally had no freaking clue he was going through it. I knew him as this super confident, funny, smart, outgoing man. So this was just such a surprise. More as a surprise than Brexit. Because I didn't suffer from it, it wasn't something that I got. But now the social shame and stigma around mental disorders is still so prominent that people are still reluctant to discuss it. And if they do, still even today, most turn to medication. Now look, I have absolutely nothing against medication or antidepressants when needed. In fact, giving someone an antidepressant drug improves symptoms within six to eight weeks in 40 to 60% of cases. Amazing, right? I mean, that's officially a modern miracle until you realize that giving someone a placebo pill for depression improves symptoms within six to eight weeks in between 20 to 40% of cases. Yep, you heard me right. The placebo treatments are almost as effective as drug treatments. Now that's not to say they don't work. Going on medication for some people is absolutely the right thing to do for their mental health, but that needs to be the last resort, not the first solution. Enters today's guest. A graduate from Columbia University Medical School and now a board certified psychiatrist, acupuncturist and yoga teacher, this woman of impact takes a functional medicine approach to mental health where she addresses the root of the problem rather than prescribing medication and putting a temporary band-aid over a gaping wound. Specialising in depression, anxiety, insomnia, women's mental health, adult ADHD, bipolar, autoimmunity and digestive issues. So please, help me welcome the woman whose mission it is to make a dent in the 300 million people worldwide that are currently suffering from depression, making it the leading cause of disability worldwide. The woman who's given actionable and tactical advice on how to change the heartbreaking truth that about a billion people worldwide have suffered from one form of mental disorder or another. The woman who is picking up a pebble and creating a tsunami in the mental health space the mental change maker herself, Ellen Vora. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show, girl. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> I'm honored to be here. So honored to have you. What you talk about is so fascinating and where I want to start is actually what I just said in the intro is the placebo effect. Yeah. Explain to me why that is so um, prominent in your field <laughs> where people um, can take one pill and it actually be a placebo and think they're getting better. Like, how does that correlate to what's actually going on? Yeah, I think it speaks to a couple of things. One is just the power of our expectation, the power of our unconscious mind. It's really this motor that's gonna drive so much of our reality. 
Um, but also it speaks to the fact that our medications are just not as effective as we'd like them to be, as we've been taught that they are. And so when you combine that, what you see is that we, we've sort of turned mental health into a science. We've tried to make it objective. But then you see people um, just doing the right thing, being good citizens, going to a doctor, saying, I need help. That takes courage. That's a really hard thing to do. And our doctors are just trained to prescribe medication, our psychiatrists. And then what happens is people go home and they take their medicine and they think, okay, I'm finally seeking help. Somebody listened to my problems. They prescribed something that's going to help me. All of that conspires to help us get a response from the medication. We feel better. We think this thing is really working. Um, and then sometimes what you see pretty frequently is that the effect eventually wears off. And we think, was that medication only temporarily mm. working? But I think what really happened there so much of the time it was only ever the placebo effect. And the placebo effect has with it um, a little bit of a bias towards this is a new exciting change I'm making, let's see if it helps. Mm. And so then that expectation is what drives the effect. Hmm. Do people act differently when they then take the placebo effect because they believe it's working and then in that action of doing something different it actually makes them better? In a way, yes. I think that it's, it can be used to leverage the initial push to more habit change. And so there's the, this idea of talking to Prozac, kind of like take the medication as a bridge and mm. then it gets you into therapy and then you start talking, you start sort of excavating the unconscious and that's where the real work begins. Or in a more holistic approach, maybe the medication is a bridge and then you start making the diet and lifestyle habit changes that, in my opinion, really make the real difference long term. Right. So someone's listening right now, they, they're starting from the beginning. It's always hard to know what you put first, right? What came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. So in situations like this, I'm always just fascinated and so like, curious about what you do first because when you're depressed you don't necessarily want to seek help you don't necessarily want to go out and i've heard you say that socializing actually is a really good thing to to do when you're depressed yeah. so take me back to like ground zero number one move if someone is in this situation do they seek help first do they look at diet first like what is that first step yeah i love that so i used to have such a protocol and such a system and say first we start with food first you're going on a whole 30 diet or you're going gluten free or i used to say like first just focus on sleep or just focus on exercise what i've learned now is that people are so different mm -hmm. and so at this point i think of it more like i offer a buffet and it's like, here's a buffet of options. Okay. And you know for yourself what you feel drawn to, what feels accessible, what feels plausible right now. Because when someone's depressed, they can barely get out of bed in the morning. They're not really necessarily even finding the motivation to take a shower, mm. let alone do the 50 things that I'm recommending mm. to help them treat their depression holistically. So right. it's a real mismatch. And I'm mm. always kind of reading people, what feels within reach to you? For some people, it's, I can exercise for five minutes a day. And for some people, it's all I can do is take a multivitamin. And then once someone has reached for something, then each change builds upon the, the last one. And so if you just make one shift, kind of called a keystone habit, like if you make one shift, you feel a little bit better, you've witnessed yourself successfully making a change. And I really like how Gretchen Rubin lays it out in her book, Happier, where some people are upholders. It's kind of like, tell me the 50 things to do, and I go home and I'm a perfect student, it's mm -hmm. like homework, and they excel at it, and they come back and they're doing everything. With those folks, I'm actually careful not to make too many recommendations oh. because it can drive people crazy and they can get too obsessive about following my instructions. That's where you start to see people developing orthorexia around healthy eating or their life gets smaller and more limited because they've developed such an elaborate system of self-care that they're saying no to spontaneity and social engagements. So upholders, I, I kind of narrow it down, make these three to five changes and then run off and come back and you know, you'll know you feel better. Some people are questioners and it's like they, they're like, convince me with science. And so then I love those conversations because, you know, I guess let's put my 10 years of, you know, education and debt to, to use and, and convince somebody <laughs> right. with science. And then some people are obligers. That's tricky too. 
-hmm. And they're going to do something out of a sense of obligation to someone else. And I really wield that carefully because then people start to worry about disappointing me Mm -hmm. if they don't do something. And you never want that vibe in the therapeutic alliance. You know, I want someone to feel safe. I want them to feel always supported by me. And if they come back and they say, I slipped up and I ate gluten or whatever it is. I don't want them to think that I'm like wagging my finger. Mm. Um, and then there's the rebels. And I don't have a ton of success with rebels. <laughs> <laughs> I love <But>, your honesty. <laughs> rebels are someone where it's like, if I say do this, they will run and do the opposite. And that's an interesting journey to be on if you are a rebel and you know this about yourself, but you're not feeling that well. I think that it's it can be a beautiful thing. It's an internal journey mm. then. It's between you and yourself, and you have to realize why. It's not out of obligation to this doctor. It's not because I do everything to please people. It's not because I do everything people to tell me to do. It's not because I was convinced with science. It's like, this is between me and myself, and I am suffering sufficiently that I'm motivated to make changes. Mm. Talk to me about the obligers, because that's fascinating. Because as you were talking, I was like, you know, there are people that really do, they like to please people. Yeah. And so in mm. those situations, how do you even start to unwind that? Yeah, I find obligers very tricky because they'll do what I ask them to do. So I feel like, oh, I'm a great doctor. They're a great patient. Everything's hunky-dory mm. here. But what you really see if you look at the subtlety of it is that people are betraying themselves. They're not doing it for themselves. They're doing it out of a need to please others um, and And I think that I want to ultimately sort of hand that back over to the patient, that this is always something that you're doing out of a sense of Mm self-love. And I think that with obligers, sometimes they get into trouble where they're they're just so people-pleasing and putting their energy to everyone else that they really burn out. And so obligers, I'm always worried that um, they're going to do my recommendations almost in service to me. Right. But how do you actually unwind it? Like if someone right now is like, oh, I'm the obliger. Yeah. Um, the worst thing, right, is to then try to do something to please somebody else. Yeah. Especially, I would assume that if you're dealing with something like depression, that you're trying to get out of being depressed, someone then, let's say, frowns upon you, says something mean, or just, you know, makes you feel bad about yourself because maybe you're not doing everything perfectly. And that seems like it would almost make your depression worse. Yeah, Yeah. so uh, take, for example, a patient of mine who, uh, she's an obliger, and she was really um, bent over backwards, taking care of everybody in her life. There were a lot of unhealthy codependent relationships, and she was really depleted. And... For her, the language that ended up really making the difference was to understand her true yes and her true no. And that's a term I borrow Mm. from Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, a book I love. And it's basically a beautiful system for us being authentic and in our truth and rather than constantly going around and kind of obligating other people and manipulating other people, it's basically saying like, here's here's my truth and trusting other people want to enrich our lives. We can give them that opportunity, but they're never obligated. They can say yes, they can say no. With my patient, she started to learn she has a true yes and a true no. It's a feeling inside. It's sort of a feeling in the gut. But I was training her to dust off this connection that she has with her own gut and intuition and start to hear the ways her body was communicating to her. Someone asked something of her. She had a a friend who would say, like, I'm not doing well. Can you come, you know, travel four hours to come take care of me this weekend? And in earlier years, she would have done that at the drop of a hat. No problem. No questions asked. And then she started to realize, "Mm, this relationship's not so reciprocal. Um, I feel like they're a taker, I'm a giver. It's feeling imbalanced. So she'd start to hear her body saying, this is my true no. And she would put a boundary. She would say, I feel for you, I'm so sorry you're in a tough place, but I actually can't do this right now. And I think obligers are at risk of going around, we all are, of going around and rather than having our true yes and our true no, we do a lot of false yes. And um, we basically, you know, someone says, hey, do you want to hang out on Thursday? And you're like, I really don't. And then you say, yeah, sure. (laughs) You know, and so we just don't like disappointing people. We don't like saying no. Um, But so practicing your true no and recognizing it is okay to set that boundary. It's okay to disappoint people. It's okay when they protest that, but you witness yourself doing this radical act of self-love and and protecting yourself and it really helps you get into a really nice peaceful relationship with yourself Mm. and do you suggest people do that in the moment or is there a way someone can do that before 
they're in that situation, right? Because it's so hard in that situation yeah. if you haven't thought through, okay, what am I going to say? How do I say it nice? <laughs> yeah. So um, does, is that what you suggest, kind of plan ahead of time in the situations or I is it? There are a couple of ways to set ourselves up for success with it. I mean, one is like as if I'm the first person saying this, but meditation, like the more we can sit in stillness and in silence with ourselves, it's a hot wire, like it's this red hotline phone that we have with our gut, with our intuition. And that's so atrophied, it's so dusty for most of us that any practices we can do that dust that off and just help us listen and be in constant dialogue with our own bodies, with our unconscious, that just helps us make more conscious choices as we navigate our lives. Mm -hmm. To basically get to, rather than just knee-jerk reflex react to things, mm. you can choose how you respond. You can say, whoa, what's going on here? My body, I'm sweating, I'm feeling tense, something is happening. Oh, I'm triggered by this situation. This makes me feel a certain way. It's actually not about them. This is something I bring to this. Um, I actually don't want to just bite their head off. It has nothing to do with this person that says something that tripped me. And so you can just make more conscious, loving choices. Mm. I think other ways to set ourselves up for success with the true no is recognizing it's a practice and that will fail like 99% of the time. So it's more focusing on the 1% of the time you get it right, you pat yourself on the back. Um, and the other times you say, okay, this is tough. It's a practice, I'm learning. Yeah, I love that. One of as you were talking, I was like, okay, what would I have done differently? So taking past situations and almost reenact them. Mm -hmm. So like if I, I really believe I'm the author of my own life, so if I were to rewrite that, how would I rewrite it? It's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Of like, but also giving yourself the grace. I love that you said that, to make those mistakes. Yeah. Because I don't think we do enough of that. And when we look back at a situation where we're like, oh, I didn't like how I responded in that moment, the attitude is everything. Mm. And it's one of gentleness, compassion mm -hmm. for ourselves, patience with ourselves. Humor, I think, is really helpful. Like, oh, like five minutes ago, I was an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm learning and growing every minute. Yeah. And I think that it's really a helpful growth mindset attitude mm -hmm. to have, to just recognize, like, yeah, we were all an asshole five minutes ago, and we just keep learning and growing. Right. But I think when we get stuck in a way of looking at our behavior in the past, and thinking like, stupid, that was the worst. Why did I say that? I shouldn't have done that. When we get into that vibe with ourselves, like we just get stuck. That's yeah. not conditions for us to move forward um, bigger, better, faster, stronger. You know, that just keeps us kind of locked and yeah, stuck. Yeah, totally agree. Um, speaking of stuck, mm. how do people get unstuck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unstuck is it, its own art form and everyone it's a little bit different. For me in my life, I think it had to do with recognizing that I was suffering. I had to start to realize that nothing in my body was feeling good. It wasn't working. And so I had to make changes. And it wasn't even like something I had to convince myself to do. It was more like I was really drawn to finding relief. And so with my patients, I usually try to find that kernel of, you know, you're suffering here and that's why we're going to make changes so that you're not suffering. And like we said before, each incremental improvement in how someone feels makes it easier to make the next shift. How do you identify, because you said um, identifying the suffering, like it sounds easy on the surface, yeah. but the truth is like in my experience when I talk to somebody, you know, let's say it's family member and they're talking to me and you ask them questions, typically the first thing that they say isn't actually the root problem, yeah. right? So it's like, I'm having a problem here, or I'm suffering here. Yeah. And then you kind of just ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, and you realize actually that had nothing to do with the root cause. Yeah. So how do you identify that moment of or what the real suffering is, and then how do you get to the root of it to then get unstuck? Yeah, so when it's something physical, that's easier. That's a little bit more obvious. Like right. someone's like, you know, I have, I don't poop, or like I'm always bloated, or I have mm -hmm. acne or migraines. You know, then it's like, okay, I think we know where you're suffering. Right. Right? But when it's more like when you find yourself with these patterns that have a quality of externalizing blame, like why does this always happen to me? Why is everybody around me a jerk? Why are men always awful? You know, whenever you find yourself in those kinds of patterns, you know, sometimes like the dating scene in your city maybe is not so good, but often when it's a pattern and it kind of feels like, why me? That's where the money is. You mm -hmm. kind of look there and that's the suffering. It's that these patterns end up actually, it sounds so woo woo, but it's a reflection of ourselves because we really train the people in our lives how to treat us and it has to do with how we view ourselves. It has to do with 
unexamined, unconscious blockages. And that's a, it's a little bit more abstract than bloating, but that's the suffering. Yeah. Um, I love that you've identified, um, which I really want to go deep on, is um, how gut health um, and immunity all have a f- correlation with depression, anxiety. I had, like, it didn't really dawn on me, so I've had massive gut issues for four years now, really been suffering. And I wouldn't say that I was clinically depressed, but there were definitely, especially in that first year, I, I couldn't barely eat anything. I mean, I was like, mm. you know, 15, 20 pounds heavier than I was now. Mm. My hair was falling out, my nails were really brittle. So my health was really bad. Mm. And for a year, because of that, because I couldn't eat much, I didn't go out and so because I wasn't going out I was feeling sad and so it I just thought it was just like an emotional thing because I couldn't go out because I couldn't eat out but you've identified there's actually a correlation between the gut health and actual depression yeah talk to me about that yeah and this one it's so revelatory for so many people and it really changes our outlook on what to do about our issues right so it's a two-way street between the gut and the brain and i think culturally we've now finally arrived at understanding the top-down communication we sort of understand like you're nervous for an exam and you get diarrhea you know we're like like, okay like we buy into that But what we're missing culturally, for the most part, is the understanding that what is going on in our gut Mm. also feeds information up to our brain and tells us sort of the state of affairs. And when our gut is out of balance, and that can be a lot of different things, um, that is sending information up to the brain and saying something's not right here. And... um, not to mention that's sort of the direct communication, but then there's also indirect communication. Anytime there's leaky gut, uh, leaky gut, or you know, a more clinical term for it would be intestinal permeability. This is where you start to have this porous lining of the intestinal tract, and then things can leak out, things that really don't belong in the bloodstream. And so we have a big immune response to that. And we're basically then systemically inflamed. Mm. And that inflammation doesn't feel good. The way I think about what does it feel like to be inflamed, it's like if you were like trekking through the jungle and it's humid and your hair is in your face and there's mosquitoes biting you and you're on your period. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like all of those feelings at Worst once. case scenario. <laughs> yeah. And so basically, um, you know, you feel inflamed. Those inflammatory markers like cytokines, they're active in our brain and they're telling our brain we're sick. And our brain is actually responding appropriately. Depression in many ways is a maladapted application of a very good evolutionary response. If we're sick, if we're inflamed, evolutionarily, it might have meant that we just drank the wrong pond water and now we have a bug and we're sick. So retreat from the tribe. Don't spread the germs. Don't be contagious. Don't necessarily engage in social activity or eating or sex. You know, it's a time to go into your cave and rest until you get better. It looks a lot like depression. And that, that system works when the problem was a bug in the pond water. And that system doesn't work when what's inflaming us is our modern world. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I've been so focused on the mind affecting the gut that it didn't really hit me hard about it being the other way. Um, that's fascinating. Okay, so if we know that the gut then can affect the brain as well, um, vice versa, but um, if you change your diet, yeah, um, that can have a direct correlation to how you feel. The problem is when you're depressed, or at least for me, when I'm sad, I just want to eat cake. Yeah. So how do you persuade, I guess, or encourage, or what are the words we can use <laughs> that when someone's in that depressed mode to not retreat and eat badly, right? Because that's typically what people do. Shut mm. the door, I don't want to see people, darkness, yeah. um, and then eat really bad food. Yeah. But that is literally the opposite to what we should be doing. So how can you encourage someone to say, no, don't eat the cake, open the windows, go outside and socialize and eat you know, the fruits and vegetables? I think it's so tough. So here are a couple bullet points of how we could do this. Let's say it's like the list on the fridge, um, accountability from loved ones, um, better treats, and then what I call teachable moments. So we'll go through that list. Just do it. I think the list on the fridge, this is what we did when we had a newborn. It's like you have a newborn and you're learning the ways of your baby and they cry and you're like, how do I soothe this thing? And you kind of have to almost like you're learning a new set of like, well, are they hungry? Um, Do they have a wet diaper? Are they tired? Are they overtired? And those are just not 
things I understood. So I needed a list on the fridge mm. to be like, remember, maybe it's this time mm. they need to be burped. And you didn't think to do that. And so you just kind of go through the bullet points and you try the different things. So for someone who's prone to depression, yeah. I think it is helpful to have like four or five things on a list on the fridge or the bathroom mirror that's like, um, you know that person that always makes you feel better? Call them. Get in an Epsom salt bath a five minute walk outside in the fresh air and sunshine. As much as it's hard to motivate, if you're just like, do it. Remember last time it helped you feel better. Or just you put on Queen and you dance around your living room. You know, something that you know will actually give you a little bit of an endorphin response. And usually when we're depressed, we lack the resourceful thinking. So you need a reminder. So that's the list. Um, accountability, I mean, I find that for me when I'm sick, like I'm not thinking as well or as clearly and I just feel like doing nothing. So my husband, like he's really good about me, like you have to gargle salt water, I'm gonna help you with elderberry. Mm. So with depression, same idea. If you're lucky enough to have someone who knows you, who helps keep you accountable and they know that if you dance around the room to queen, you'll feel better. Even if you can't motivate yourself, someone who can just give you a loving mm. nudge, um, that can be really powerful. So the third one is better treats. And this one I find is really helpful in my own life. Um, we all get those moments where it's like you just want a treat. You're, if you had a bad day, you're feeling really down, you're craving sweets, you're craving carbs. And I basically have ways of eating something that I know will hit that spot, but that doesn't get my body out of balance. And there are things that exist. They just require a little more creative thinking. So for me, it's like if I'm craving carbohydrates, which happens usually like in the luteal phase of your cycle, then I'm gonna have um, ready to go in the fridge a vat of fried plantains and like sauteed plantains mm -hmm. with coconut oil and cinnamon. And that hits the spot, but that to me, it's a starchy vegetable. It's mm -hmm. actually not getting my body inflamed or out of balance. I still feel good afterward, but it really scratches that itch. Mm -hmm. um, there used to be uh, this really like $13 coconut milk at the juice press, which for me was a perfect option if I was like, I had a terrible day, I need a treat. $13 is a lot for a beverage, but not a lot for like, rescuing yourself in a day and mm -hmm. I would have that and I found it really delicious and satisfying and it made me feel better afterward not worse. And so you were saying stay away from um, inflammatory foods that contain sugar, what else? Would well you sugar and I think for everyone it's a little bit different but sometimes it's gluten, sometimes it's dairy, sometimes it's just processed foods as a whole category and those are the kinds of treats we, we all are drawn to them when we're feeling low because they're all kind of the drug-like foods mm -hmm. gluten, dairy, sugar, <laughs> processed foods with their flavor crystals and so we want a drug so I think that in those moments just recognizing that those treats will lift you up you'll get the drug effect but then they drop you lower than you started mm -hmm. and then that becomes a vicious cycle and that kind of ties into the fourth one, which is teachable moments. And for me, it took a decade of learning, kind of learning that lesson over and over again. It's like when I, I was doing really well, eating gluten-free and avoiding foods that inflamed my body, and then I would have a tough situation. I'd be traveling or I was at a wedding or um, a stressful day at work, and then I would have one of those kinds of treats. And you feel so justified. Our whole culture teaches Boy. you to treat yourself but then I would feel worse afterward. And I think at a certain point, just the experiential connection to like a bodily feeling of like, I did that before to solve the problem. It didn't solve the problem, it made things worse. Like once you've learned that lesson 100,000 times, then you're like, okay, I actually don't wanna make that mistake again. Right. So I think it takes some teachable moments and you just keep staying patient with yourself through that and almost brand it as a positive. Mm -hmm. Like every time I do a pitfall again, rather than like, Ellen, bad, stupid. It's more like, okay, you Useful. I have a very recent teachable moment to remember next time I'm in this situation. God, that's amazing. Those were so good. Um, okay, I'm a perfectionist. Uh -huh. So everything you just said to me, if I was in the situation, I've like, got this, I'm going to stick to my list, I'm going to call this person, I'm going to make sure this. Um, and then obsessiveness though, wow. and then being perfect can actually be the worst thing and even more detrimental to you. Um, and I heard you talking about orthorexia. Yeah. Um, talk to me about that and how we can actually not now slip into that side of things. Yeah, super interesting. So I have sort of controversial views about eating disorder in general, um, but I think at least for me to get very personal about it, back when I was still eating all the foods, 
um, it really gave me eating disorderly behaviors. It made me sort of go on this alternating cycle between restricting and binging. And I actually think it had to do with the fact that I was addicted to certain foods. I was addicted to the foods that happen to be the ones I don't tolerate, that they really inflame my body. And I don't really understand why the human body works in this way, but the things that inflame us seem to be what addicts us. Mm -hmm. And then when you're addicted to something, there's all those feelings like any drug addiction, out of control, and you sort of like want to go all the way clean, and then you're clean, and your body is waiting for its hit, and so then you sort of binge later, and it just swing back and forth between those two poles. And so for me, I finally found freedom from that relationship to food by abstaining from the foods that were addicting why? me. And that's totally counter to eating disorder orthodoxy. Like they would say, nothing is restricted, everything in moderation. And I think there's some beauty to the idea of like three square meals a day and two snacks and just normalizing your eating patterns. But I think for some of my patients who are in a similar situation, abstaining from gluten, dairy, sugar, um, and for some of my vegetarian patients, nut butter seems to be, which is interestingly a common trigger food, especially for people not eating meat. Um, that usually ends up giving them the freedom from their eating disorder. But then what we have now is a slide towards a kind of clean eating, obsessive eating disorder called orthorexia, which I define it as like, you've become so obsessive about eating right and eating the right things, it's its own eating disorder. Why? It's kind of glorified eating disorder in the name of clean eating and doing mm. the right thing. And the way to identify it is you just want to kind of check in and check, check temperature on your relationship to this eating pattern in the food. Is there ease? Is there freedom? Is it all generally coming from a place of self-love or is it self-castigation and negation and basically deprivation? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I know in myself, partly because I know what it's like for me to have a disorderly attitude towards eating, I know what it's like to have a joyous and um, free and like self-loving and an attitude towards food that's like I delight in it, but I also respect myself when it's like, sure, it would be a lot of fun to have a piece of cake right now, but I will feel lousy afterward. So I say no to that piece of cake in a very different way today than I would have 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it would have been like, no, I shouldn't, uh, uh, I need to go home and binge on that cake alone when no one's looking what was that? And today it's like, actually, I'm content. I am, I feel satiety from the healthy foods I ate. That cake will just make me feel lousy. I've learned that lesson a hundred thousand painful times. And from a place of joyous, righteous self-love, it's like, no, thank you. And I don't even look back. So I think that orthorexia is when you're kind of like, no, I don't eat cake. I don't eat gluten, dairy. I don't eat sugar. I'm, everything's perfect. I'm going to live forever. I don't make any mistakes. And I think it's really important to kind of willfully choose to make some mistakes. And it's mm. mistakes, right? It's like that I'll eat generally the way I like to eat, maybe 80% of the time when I'm at home eating my own home cooked food and I'm out at a restaurant with friends, like I slacken the reins quite a bit. I still don't do things that are going to get me really out of balance, mm. but I will eat in a way that's just delighting in the experience of sharing a meal with people I love. And you kind of need to know that the way you're eating isn't making your life smaller. It's not standing in the way of social connection, which might even be more healthy for us than even clean eating. <laughs> and that's how you start to know, like, here's how you can have a healthy relationship with eating in a very deliberate way. That's what I was going to say, because it really is one knocks onto the other, right? So you're saying, <clears throat> if you're de dealing with depression, anxiety, food can really make a difference, making sure that you're eating the right foods. So I go, okay, cool, I'm going to eat the right foods. I start eating the right foods. I'm really proud of myself that I'm eating the right foods. Then someone asks me to come out with them and there's no possible way I can eat clean, let's yeah. say. What do you do in those situations? When is it, when do you advise to be like, you know what, maybe you shouldn't go? Or like, no, you should still force yourself to go because by being social, it will then help you when you get home to keep eating clean that will then help with your brain. I love this. I love this. So um, let's say a couple options. Yeah. Um, one is what I call pre-eating. <laughs> so eat your meal beforehand mm -hmm. and eat something really satiating. Eat something with a lot of healthy fats and a lot of protein so that you're showing up and you're just drinking seltzer or whatever and you're just happy to engage with the people that you love. I think if a situation is not willing to accommodate your dietary needs, and your dietary needs, you're not doing this to be difficult, you're not doing this to be better than other people, you're doing this because you don't feel good when you eat in other ways, and if it's my friends and they're hosting, 
you know, can I bring a dish? Can I contribute to the, to the dinner party so that there's something there I can eat? And if the answer is really no, um, if these are people that love me, that are sort of serving me, in, you know, like in the higher sense, um, they'll usually accommodate. And if it's really out of everyone's hands and it's impossible, um, then I think sometimes the right choice is to show up and eat the food. Mm. I do that once in a while. And even if I know I will have acne tomorrow and constipation and everything will feel off for a few days, sometimes the right choice is just to indulge in it and share Mm. in that experience. But I think that at the end of the day, if it's people that really do love you and care about you, they will accommodate on some level and they're not going to pressure you. Mm. And if that's not happening, I think it is worth stepping back and asking, like, are these really my people? Um, I've found that there are certain situations that are just like, kind of like toxic social situations for me and that's where I end up eating the food that makes me feel unwell and leaving feeling triggered and it wasn't just that I ate the bagel there it was everything about that social situation Mm. those were not people that were bringing out the best in me yeah um talk to me about shame because the one thing that I hear a lot and even now I mean you think that you know now that we're speaking more about it and it's really become more of an open thing that people aren't judging as much Mm -hmm. but I still think there's certain amounts of shame around mental disorders mental health um what do you suggest how do people take that first step to either ask for help or just speak up and let a friend know that hey I'm really struggling um because I would assume that when you're when you're feeling depressed, the sh- the weight of the shame would just feel like it's going to make things worse. You almost keep it to yourself more. Yeah, yeah. Shame is such a big and important topic, and I personally have felt like my life has been changed since I've read Brene Brown and you know her, all of her books really. Like to to understand vulnerability and shame as such fundamental drivers of how we navigate the world. And I think with shame, I like the idea that it's kind of a mildew that cannot flourish in sunshine. And I think the sunshine, the antiseptic to it, is opening up authentically, vulnerably, and and basically letting yourself be seen and then, and then realizing that when you're open and vulnerable, you're still accepted, you're still worthy, you're still okay. I also think that there's something really profound about developing compassion and understanding for the people that trained you to feel ashamed. Ooh, and I think that, that, I think that can mean? be really powerful. So a lot of us, like we carry around shame basically because of the conditioning we got from early relationships, usually with parents or somebody important in our life. And it was not that they were like trying to give us shame because they wanted us to be miserable. It's that parenting is so hard that, you know, pretty much all parents are just treading water and trying to survive. And now these days we kind of got the memo of like, you want to be authoritative, but you don't want to be authoritarian. Like if I didn't know better, I would say things like, Um, Be a good girl and put your shoes on. If you don't do that, you're a bad girl. I would withdraw my love and approval. And it would get the job done. You know, my daughter would think, I'm at risk of losing my mother's love and approval. Like, that is basic survival. That's first chakra, like, security and trust in that she can even be okay in the world. And so she's not going to mess around with that. She's going to put her shoes on. But I don't do that because I don't actually want her to grow up and have all of these pockets of shame of like, I'm a good girl if I please people and I'm a bad girl if I don't, which is problematic as we grow up. And then, you know, that's how we go on to be obligers and to be people that just please others at our own expense. But a lot of people's parents were authoritarian because it got the job done. They were not trying to hurt us. They were just surviving as parents, but it created a lot of pockets of shame within us because we thought like, I am a good girl if I get good grades, if I excel, if I achieve, if I'm perfectionist, um, if I do what people ask of me. And that just came from parents trying to survive. And so just compassion and understanding for that can really unlock something in us. And we realize like, I don't have to be beholden anymore to that system of if I please others, then I'm worthy. Like that was all a false system, not done by bad people, just regular flawed humans trying to do their best. 
And so when you start to look at yourself and just realize like, I am just inherently worthy just for existing. I am here just trying to do my best like all of us. I am a flawed human, but I grow and I change and I keep trying to do my best and I keep improving a little bit and backsliding and improving. Mm. And I think that that's the way we can just start to talk to ourselves in a way that's very antiseptic to shame. Wow, that was really powerful. Um, Talk to me if you don't mind. I know you have been open about talking about it, but about miscarriages. I know that you just suffered a miscarriage. Yeah. Um, And you've spoken openly about how the fact that women feel so much shame around it. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I got pregnant in November, and I think I was about 10 weeks pregnant, and I decided... I'm going to share this on social media, not because I'm not really big into sharing my personal life in my social media, but I was starting to notice that women don't talk about their pregnancies until they're in the second trimester, around 12 weeks, because miscarriage is very common in the first trimester. There's a lot of pregnancy loss. There's a lot of uncertainty in the first trimester. So we all wait until the safe zone, and then we say, I'm pregnant. And I think that there's a problem with that which is um, is a few problems. One is that that first trimester is when you're usually most tired, most nauseated, you feel your worst. You're at work and you have this secret, which is that you're pregnant. So you can't ask to have your needs met. You can't ask for help. You can't ask for patience with the fact that you are not your best self because it's a secret. So you just sort of like fake it and make it through the day. You're like, I really need a nap or to go throw up. And, you know, and, and I think that I would like our culture to get more comfortable talking about pregnancy in the first trimester, partly so that women don't have to suffer in silence. Um, but I think an even more profound reason that we should feel comfortable talking about it is that when all of us wait until the second trimester to talk about our pregnancies, it creates this illusion that all pregnancies you hear about magically work out because most pregnancies that make it to the second trimester ultimately are a viable baby. And so then the fact that miscarriage is so common means that when it happens to someone, their their pregnancy is a secret, they can't really talk about it with too many people in their lives, and they think, it's just me. Like, why is it just me? It only happened to me. And they think everybody else has their beautiful babies and this all happened so easily for them, but I had a miscarriage. And that's not okay, especially when the numbers are really on someone's side there. It's common. Miscarriage happens, full stop. And it's normal. It's natural. It's part of the whole process. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean you did something wrong. It doesn't mean you're a failure as a woman. It doesn't mean any of that. It's just part of the design. We have errors of um, chromosomal copying as we make our babies. And so sometimes they're non-viable fetuses and mother nature's checks and balances is miscarriage Mm -hmm. and so it's really common but everyone is suffering in silence and shame when it happens and they don't realize just how common it is so I wanted to model talking about pregnancy in the first trimester and I just wanted to, to sort of open up a conversation that this is something we should explore and dabble in if it feels good for us and then I was almost into the second trimester and I miscarried and this was my first time having a miscarriage And in the minute it happened, you know, and it happened in a very sort of sudden and obvious way, I thought, gulp, um, this, you know, really called me on my bluff. Like, Mm -hmm. my whole point was we should feel comfortable talking about our miscarriages. (laughs) And then, you know, here I am on Instagram, basically um, kind of cracking open my heart, right, as I'm going through something really tender and fresh. Um, It was a it's like everything in life it's this journey inward deeper and deeper and i did it in a public way that's so powerful thank you for sharing that i've known a few people who've had miscarriages and when i was younger i remember somebody in my family had a miscarriage and she went into somewhat of a depression yeah um do you think that that is related to the shame the guilt the feeling like i did something wrong um and what is the, I guess, the physio- physiological thing that is happening there that is then feeding from the brain to the stomach to the shame to the guilt? Yeah. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up, yeah. So, of course, the shame and the guilt is a piece of it. It's a big piece of it. And I think that that's part of the problem is that women have these miscarriages, they don't realize how common it is, they start to blame themselves, they feel like a failure. And understandably, if you haven't had a kid yet when you have a miscarriage, you think, will I ever get to have a baby? Mm. You know, will my future not be what I envision and what I yearn for? The fear. And then um, I think there's another piece of it, which is that 
Our culture does not have a tradition or an understanding around the fact that miscarriage is a postpartum period. We don't have any cultural expectation around oh. you need to rest, you need to drink bone broth every day, you need to do vaginal steaming. We barely have that understanding as a culture when it comes to pregnancy. You know, you just give birth and some people are sort of like, let's, you know, get back to work in six weeks. We don't have paid parental leave. We um, think, you know, bounce back to your figure. Like we just don't have a culture of how do you support a postpartum mom? It's an investment in your future. It's an investment in your relationship with the baby and the baby's future. And then it's also really an investment mm. in protecting your mental health because it's a very raw, vulnerable time. We're nutritionally depleted. Um, there's a hormonal crash and it's a total role transition in all of these ways and so basically um, you know the postpartum period of miscarriage same thing goes it's still a hormonal crash you still need to kind of warm and support the body and rest but we have no system for taking time off from work for asking for our needs in that moment because it was already a secret to begin right, with. Right, that's what I was going to say, yeah. yeah. And so I kind of, I didn't even know this and I am like so deep in the trenches of women's health and these more nuanced and very like woman-centric understandings of health. I got it when it came to pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum and nursing. I really understood that. I had a miscarriage and I was like running errands the next day. And I was like, I'm pretty sure running around New York City to all these different appointments is not what my body needs right now. Like I need mm. to be lying down, sipping broth, resting. And so to really listen to your body in this setting is also always at the utmost wow, importance. Wow, yeah. Um, so you're resting, you're having the right things. The one thing that I had seen this person who I, growing up I'd seen had a miscarriage, it really hit me because I remember I always saw them as like super strong, like nothing like ever knocked them. They were trying for a baby, they you know, got mm. pregnant, so excited. Then she lost the baby and I mm. saw her go into somewhat of a depression. And it then leads to she doesn't go out, she stays at home alone yeah. by herself all the time. And I've heard you talk about loneliness yeah. and how loneliness now is actually, you know, the equivalent of smoking, is it's the new smoking. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about loneliness, and I didn't realize it can be that detrimental to our health. Oh yeah, yeah, so lack of community, it is our modern epidemic, alongside stress and sort of our modern sleep and social media addiction. But I think that it's, um, what happens is, our world right now is really designed for isolation. Um, everything from our jobs to the fact that we're kind of in more of a relationship with our phones than with the people in the room, um, down to the fact that we're siloed off in our houses and our cars and our, our urban planning, nothing is really designed on the walking scale, on the village scale, where it's like you just go about your day and you, have, you interface with people. Um, and I think that it's all too easy, especially if you're feeling low, for it to just dig the, the hole of isolation deeper and deeper. And it impacts our longevity, it impacts our risk for dementia, and it certainly impacts our immune health and, and everything about mental can health. Can you just say that again? That was so It can actually affect dementia. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Cognitive function is related to social interaction, That's which totally crazy. makes sense. It does. Yeah. I mean, when you really break it down, but like, that's... Let yeah. that sink in, guys. Yeah, it's, it's usually the path of more resistance to interact with people. Mm. People are awful, right? Like, we're all self-absorbed and selfish. We ask the wrong questions. We're staring at our phones. Like, it's tough. Like, family, it's tough. They push our buttons because they're the ones that put them there. So it is the path of least resistance to decline social situations, to kind of say no, to just retreat and to burn bridges, to just say, this relationship isn't worth it anymore. It's too difficult. Why? Um, and sometimes it is the right thing to do, to put a boundary, to say, you know what, this relationship, I've tried and tried, it's really not serving me, I'm not gonna keep kind of getting into this codependent, you know, situation. But I think that um, often what we actually have to do is reprogram ourselves to say, I am going to lean into social connection. You still protect 
your introverted regroup time. That's important. But when a social situation feels like, I don't feel like it, I just want to stay home and watch my shows, or I don't feel like it, that person you know, makes me feel envious. But when we're stuck in um, patterns of really not enjoying the people around us, it's usually not our best selves. It's usually kind of a low vibration state to be in. Mm. And gently, lovingly, patiently, compassionately catching ourselves and just saying, like, I choose love. And it's tough. Like, I am below average at this. You know, my husband is somebody who's above average at this. And I learn from watching him. But it's basically this interaction is tough. I want to retreat. I want to be mad at them. I want to feel justified and righteous and like, that person sucks. So I'm going to like, you know, ice them or whatever. It's like, you choose love and you just keep going back toward the social connection. And rather than sort of spirals of judgment, spirals of understanding and compassion, because I mean, a psychiatrist, it's a great job for many reasons, tough job, it's a great job. But one thing you get to do is anybody who walks into your office, you get to understand everything that makes them struggle in life. And if we were all psychiatrists to each other, we would realize like we're all carrying a heavy burden. Everyone is very likable and sympathetic when you know the full struggle. And so rather than choosing to not like people in our lives and kind of wanting to get into a whole negative dynamic with them, can we step back and view the situation and see, oh, that person, shitty behavior, but it's because they were taught this model from their, their parents, or right now they're in a really stressful time in their marriage, or they don't have enough support and they're strung out and sleep deprived and they don't have enough childcare. You just sort of start to understand what someone's working with. They might still have flawed behavior, and we don't need to blind ourselves to that. I'm the biggest fan of calling out recognizing flawed behavior, but it doesn't have to end there. You don't have to just kind of burn the bridge because of flawed behavior. You can understand flawed behavior is within a context of somebody struggling and just trying to do their best. And they might really be sucking, but they're doing their best. And it gives you a little bit of a path for keep going and keep working at the relationship. I love that. What do you consider your superpower to be? Um, so I think that my superpower is actually just that I think differently. And I think that that was tough for many years. That made me feel alienated throughout mm. um, certainly medical school and residency. And I felt like I'm a worse doctor. I will never be good enough. I just don't fit in here. Um, but I think that ultimately it's really helped me carve my own path and and just I had to practice in a way that felt in alignment for me. I had to keep asking myself hard questions about what do I really believe because I definitely, it was never a fit what I was being taught. Um, so ultimately I think it helps me help people better and it's a lot of fun to be skeptical and question everything about our reality. Um, so I love thinking differently. I love that. And where could people follow you and find everything that you're doing? Um, I'm all over the internet. I'm at Ellen Vora MD on Instagram and um, I have YouTube and Facebook and a website which is ellenvora.com. Amazing. Guys, you've got to check her out. She's freaking amazing. Go back and rewatch this episode. She dropped so many bombs, things that I'd never heard of before. So please go check it out again. Rewatch this episode. And if you're not following me, guys, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if you're not subscribed and this episode has brought you value, guys, please do click that subscribe button. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. What up guys, Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.